before we begin, if you are not in the habit of going full screen, it might be better to watch this one on full screen. When Carl Sagan was a, a little boy, he went to his local library, I believe in Brooklyn, New York, and he asked for a book on stars. The lady who was trying to help him showed him a book of Hollywood movie stars without realizing that the boy she was talking to was a, a little more curious than that. I have my favorite stars and I'm going to show you one of them in a, a roundabout journey. I also said in my previous video that, uh, or one of my previous videos, that astrophotography had improved over the years and I, I want to give you a, a quick 10 minute demonstration to prove that point. And also I'd like to thank Nophilist for sending me one of the most amazing photographs that I have ever, or probably will ever see, uh, which inspired this video. As you can see, this constellation is called the Southern Cross. It's only visible from the southern hemisphere of Earth. Don't go looking for it in the, the night skies of North America. I don't think it's visible from there, but I'm sure I can be corrected in the comments if that's not the case. To the left, that's not an astronomical term, you'll find the famous Alpha Centauri, but that's not on this photo, I don't think. I'll start here because it's pretty. And the dark feature that you see below the Southern Cross is quite interesting. That's called the Coal Sack. It's not uh, an area devoid of stars. It's a large, dense cloud of dust between us and the background stars, which you can probably see are quite numerous. Uh, but this isn't what I brought you here to see. We're going to be taking a look at the Keyhole Nebula. Now I'm doing a bit of guesswork here, but this photograph is about the best, or the equivalent of the best sort of photograph of the, the centre of the Keyhole Nebula that we'd, be, we'd have been able to get in the 40s, probably more likely the 50s, early 60s. So if you were living at that time, this is about the best that you would have seen, no matter how curious you were, and no matter what your desire to see better, this is what you would have had to have lived with, and it would have seemed pretty amazing at the time. Of course, they did a little bit better in the, the 60s and 70s, as you're about to see. And in the 70s, if you were a child like me, and you pored over astronomical photographs, this was quite an improvement. Um, Photographs like this filled my childhood, and I was amazed to be living at a time when you could see things like this in such detail. You'll notice that a lot of the stars seem to be between ourselves and the nebula itself. In some cases that will be true. In some cases that the stars that are simply shining through the nebula. But many of these stars are in the foreground. What you're looking at is a beast in the distance. And this is the photo that inspired this video as sent to be sent to me by Nophilist. When I knew that this was the uh, a close up detail of the, the Keyhole Nebula or the Carina Nebula as it's sometimes known, I knew that somewhere in this photo was an object called Eta Carina or Eta Carinae. Uh, I went looking for it being something of a genius, it didn't take me too long to find it. I wonder if you can see it. It's one of the most remarkable stars that we know of in the universe. Um, the scale of the photo, I'm, a, I'm afraid Nophilist, I've forgotten what the scale of the photo is, but I'm guessing that's maybe 10 light years across, maybe more. It, it could be as much as 30 light years. The reason I say that will become a little bit more obvious as we zoom in onto the object that I really brought you here to see, aside from this amazing Hubble Space Telescope image. Okay, let's set off and go looking for Eta Carinae. Apologies for the, the very slow zoom, but 
I just want to give you an idea of scale and let you see some of the, the beauty as we we go to the star of my choice. Well it doesn't look like an ordinary star and it isn't an ordinary star and in my childhood this would have been just about as satisfying as a, an astronomical photograph could have been. Um, in case you haven't guessed it, Hubble can actually do better than this. The photograph that we started off with, the, the one that I rave about, is taken with the, the wide angle uh, lens, <laughs> for want of a better word, of the, the Hubble Space Telescope, the wide angle camera. Um, it has better cameras for looking at smaller objects. And let's take a look at one of those better photographs. Mmm, check that baby out. Guess what? We can do better yet. Here's my baby in all her glory. This is Eta Carani. To give you an idea of scale, from lower left to upper right, the object is 0 0.7 light years across, so it's, it's a light year near as damn it. The lobes that you see on either side extending from the star are the result of an explosion, an eruption, that took place on the star in 1840 and throughout the 1840s. The lobes contain 12 times the mass of our sun. They're still extending into space at 1.5 million miles per hour. The star itself is 100 times the mass of our sun and were it to sit where our sun sits in the center of our solar system it would engulf all the planets out to Jupiter. Jupiter. It is huge. Um, but because it's huge and because it's heavy it's short-lived. Uh, it's a universal rule that the heavier a star is the shorter its life will be. We're very fortunate that our sun is a nice, small, modest star. That means it's going to have a long life, 10,000 million years in total. We're about, well, we're almost exactly halfway through that point now, so we've got another 5 billion years to sort ourselves out. This star will go supernova in the next, somewhere in the next, I don't know, hundreds of thousands, millions of years. It could happen next Tuesday at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. When it does happen, uh, the people in the southern hemisphere will be able to read their newspapers by it on a moonless night and it may be visible during, well it will be visible during the day all we've got to do is live long enough and not kill each other and we'll be able to see something fairly spectacular happen at some point in the future if you think that Tom Cruise is a superstar he's not He's a man who stands in front of a camera and pretends. He pretends for a living. Eta Carani is a superstar. And if you want to know what possible connection there can be between you and objects like this, you should remember that the material in your body and everything you touch, if you reach out to anything wherever you are right now watching this and touch it, the atoms that you touch including the atoms in your finger with which you touch and in your blood and in your bones came from the center of a star like Eta Carinae that ended, it exi ended its existence in a supernova and at the center of that star is where all the, he the heavy elements are made it is the only place in the universe with the temperatures and the pressures required to turn hydrogen and helium into the heavier elements like carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, etc, etc. You came out of a star like this. No, I'm not kidding. You really did. What you're looking at is the equivalent of your great, 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 etc, etc. grandfather or grandmother, depending on how you want to look at it. The connection between you and objects like Eta Carinae 
is absolutely intimate. You're made of the sort of stuff you're looking at right now. And it's the only place in the universe that it could possibly have come from. That's how we know we are made of stars.